Yes, I'm Jim Cheney. I'm from the FAA. Oh, no, no, no. Nobody's leaving. Normally, they're heading for the door to lock their hangers. <laughs> no, I don't do that anymore. This is not about me, though. This is about uh, the person that's going to receive this award, the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award. I really, really enjoy doing this. Uh, people ask me, well, when are you going to retire? I'm 66 years old. I will never retire. As long as I can talk, I'm good to go. Give me a souped-up wheelchair, put me behind a mic, and I can present these awards. We also present the Master Mechanic Awards. This individual should have got both of them but he's a little slow. He's been shot down a couple times. So we'll give him that uh, um, lead way anyway. But uh, just one note about this award. Uh, if you've been flying for 50 years, you're not supposed to have any incidents or accidents. Uh, if you have 50 years and you have an incident, fill out an application and send it to me because I'm the one that determines whether or not this was you know, pilot hiccup or a blatant uh, violation of a regulation. So don't think that you're, you can't get this award because you had a violation against you. You know, we, we take everything into account and we will for, for your award if you uh, put in for it. You won't know until you put in for it, okay? So get those applications in. Uh, my email address is, is uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, Clyde to have uh, my email address. Send it to me via email because it won't get to me, okay? Because the USPS is really messed up because of COVID. It's still going on, and it's going to go to another building, and I may never see it for three, four months. Email it to me. I'll see it tomorrow, okay? So the, master, uh, master, uh, the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award, uh, you have to hold a U.S. Uh, Civil Aviation Authority, which it was, was the CAA back then, or Federal Aviation Administration Pilot Certificate. We will count time as uh, military flight time also. But the thing is, is you have to have an FAA certificate somewhere along the way. If you got an FAA certificate, you flew for 50 hours, well, we'll say 100 hours, and you ended up having medical issues, it doesn't matter. We don't look at the flight time. We look at your circumstances and we look at uh, uh, your pilot certificate and when you got it. And if you were a military pilot, we'll count that time also. Whoops, sorry um, uh, about that. I'm not normally, I don't stand behind a podium, so I'm having an issue here. <laughs> you have to be a U.S. citizen. You have not had any airman certificate revoked. Okay, you don't see anywhere on there where it says that you can't have any violations, you can't have any incidents, you can't have any accidents. Okay, this was changed, Bob, probably in the middle of COVID. So that's why I'm telling you and stressing, if you can... If you think you want this award, you've got 50 years, you send me the application. And you and I will talk about it, and we'll try to get you that award. Okay? Uh, okay, here's the bad part is be of good moral character defined by the immigration department. Okay? Uh, you know, I tell you, I, I get, these, uh, I get these, certain, these, these pilot records, and, you know, I, I stand and I shake them to see how much dirt comes out of them. You know, and this this next applicant, all I could find was dust. He's no, he doesn't have any dirt in there whatsoever. Okay, so let's see here. Now the next the next slide is actually going to be a short video. It's going to be like a, a a history lesson for 15 minutes and 15 seconds. If you have a a, a slow stopwatch, it's 15 minutes and 16 seconds. So. Uh, just kick back and this will tell you a little bit about the awards, okay?
December 17, 1903. The place, a windswept beach at Kitty Hawk. Something new was happening in the sky above North Carolina. Humans at last found a way to join the birds. It was the first time ever that a machine carrying a man powered itself successfully through the air. What Wilbur and Orville Wright achieved, along with their mechanic, Charles Taylor, would both open up the skies and shrink the planet. It would change civilization permanently. The story of flight is a story about three men who were involved in the invention and development of the first powered airplane. First, they had to invent the airplane. Next, teach themselves to fly. Then design and build an airplane engine and propulsion system. And finally, craft an original propeller. The story of flight is a story about genius. Everyone knows about Orville and Wilbur Wright, but that third man was Charles E. Charlie Taylor, a quiet genius who loved cigars and the sound of machinery. Wilbur and Orville formed the Wright Cycle Company in 1892, selling, repairing, and manufacturing bicycles. In the summer of 1896, Orville was struck by the dreaded typhoid. It was a month before he could set up in bed, another two weeks before he could get out of bed, and during this time, Wilbur had begun reading aloud to Orville about the German glider enthusiast Otto Lilienthal who had just recently been killed in an accident. Once fully recovered from his illness, Orville proceeded with the same reading list as Wilbur. This was the spark that ignited Wilbur and Orville's passion for flight. Since 1898, Orville and Wilbur had been using the services of a local machinist, Charles E. Charlie Taylor, for special projects from their bicycle shop. Recognizing the need for someone to work their bicycle business while they were away at Kitty Hawk pursuing their experiments with gliders, the Wrights hired Charlie for the job in June of 1901. It was this connection that would eventually launch the first powered airplane. Charlie was born on a little farm in Cerro Gordo, Illinois on May 24, 1868, and from an early age it was apparent that Charlie was mechanically inclined. At the age of 12, he left school and began working with machinery in a bookbinding company where mechanics came easy for him. In 1896, Charlie moved his family to Dayton, Ohio, where Charlie worked for Stoddard Manufacturing, making farm equipment and later bicycles. After one of the trips to Kitty Hawk and the dismal performance of their 1901 glider, the Wright brothers decided they needed more accurate information than was currently available and decided to build a wind tunnel. This tool would use delicate force balances enabling them to accurately measure the amount and direction of air pressures on plane and curved surfaces when operated at various angles. Building the wind tunnel was the first job that Charlie Taylor did for the Wright brothers that had any connection with aeronautics. The Wright brothers did many experiments in this wind tunnel, and they used this data to design and build the 1902 glider. On October 31st, 1902, the Wrights returned to Dayton to make plans for a powered airplane. Through their experiments, the Wrights were able to accurately predict the horsepower required to produce and achieve powered flight. They sent detailed specs to 10 companies, for an engine that would produce eight horsepower and weigh no more than 200 pounds. Within a month, all 10 companies wrote back to say it can't be done. Failing to find any engine manufacturers who could produce or modify an engine, the Wright brothers decided to design and build their own engine, giving that task to their mechanic, Charlie Taylor, and they would build the airframe. Charlie started building the engine in the winter of 1902. Later, Charlie would tell a reporter. 
started on repairing bicycles back in uh, in the 80s. And then I later went to Dayton and built bicycles for the Stoddard Manufacturing Company. And they were just starting up in the bicycle business. And I, I got acquainted with the Wrights and I built bicycles for them. I did all the repair work while they went down Kitty Hawk to try out their gliders. Well, and all they needed was power to keep on flying. Why well, then, when we designed the motor, I made, made all the different parts in the, in the motor. I even made the crankshaft. So I made it out of a solid block of steel, uh, about 32 inches long, 6 inches wide, and inch and 5 eighths thick. Charlie finished the engine in six weeks, an amazing accomplishment considering he was only using a drill press, a lathe, and hand tools. In February 1903, Charles E. Taylor successfully completed the first aircraft engine. Since 1899, Wilbur and Orville had been scientifically experimenting with the concept of flight. It was the Wrights of genius and vision to see that humans would have to fly their machines. In Wilbur's words, it is possible to fly without motors, but not without knowledge and skill. With over a thousand glides from atop Big Kill Devil Hill, the Wrights made themselves the first true pilots. These flying skills were a crucial component of their invention. And before they ever attempted powered flight, the Wright brothers were masters of the air. In September 1903, the Wrights along with Charlie returned to their camp at Kill Devil Hills. They mounted the engine on the new 40-foot, 605-pound flyer with the intention of flight. A bulky engine and broken propeller shaft slowed them until they were finally ready on December 14th. In order to decide who would fly first, the brothers tossed a coin. Wilbur won the coin toss, but lost his chance to be the first to fly when he oversteered with the elevator after leaving the launching rail. The flyer climbed too steeply, stalled and dove into the sand, slightly damaging the forward elevator. The flyer was airborne for only three and one half seconds, but the power of the engine and the responsiveness of the controls bolstered Wilbur's confidence. He wrote home, there is now no question of final success. Three days later, on December 17th, they were ready for a second attempt. The brothers were dressed in coats and ties that December morning for an event that would alter the world. The 27 mile per hour wind was harder than they would have liked since their predicted cruising speed was only 30 to 35 miles per hour. The headwind would slow their ground speed to a crawl, but they proceeded anyway. Now it was Orville's turn. Words were impossible over the engine's roar, so they shook hands and Orville predestined himself on the flyer. At 10.35, he released the restraining wire. The flyer moved down the rail as Wilbur steadied the wings. After a run of about 40 feet, the flyer left the ground. Again, the flyer was unruly, pitching up and down as Orville overcompensated with the controls. Nevertheless, he kept it aloft until it hit the sand about 120 feet from the rail. A total flight of 12 seconds into the 27 mile per hour wind. The brothers took turns flying three more times that day, getting a feel for the control and increasing their distance with each flight. The right machine had flown, but it would not fly again. After the last flight, it was caught by a gust of wind, rolled over and damaged beyond easy repair. With their flying season over, the Wrights sent their father a matter-of-fact telegram reporting the modest numbers behind their amazing achievement. The Wright brothers and Taylor built the first wind tunnel used for aerodynamic research. Orville designed and built instruments from old hacksaw blades and bicycle spokes to measure lift and drag, representing his solid understanding of geometry, mathematics, aerodynamic forces, and illustrated the Wright's engineering talents at their finest. 
The Wrights used an unusual forward elevator mounted in front of the wings, known as a canard, which lessens the violent reaction that generally occurs when an aircraft with a rear-mounted elevator stalls or loses lift. With a canard, the aircraft settles more gently after a stall, a characteristic that saved the lives of Wilbur and Orville on several occasions. The Wrights placed the high point of the wing's curve much closer to the wing's leading edge and made the depth of the curvature fairly shallow in contrast to the norm of the day. They believed this would reduce the movement of the center of pressure, making the aircraft more stable and easier to control. The Wrights developed the first three-axis control system, which featured wing warping for lateral balance, a movable rudder, and an elevator for pitch control. A hip cradle worked the wing warping and coupled rudder. A simple wooden lever held in the left hand controlled the elevator. This three axis control system was their single most important design breakthrough. In its final form, the 1902 Wright Glider was the world's first fully controllable airplane. The Wright brothers and Charlie Taylor developed the first aircraft propulsion system. The term propulsion system is important as the Wrights and Charlie recognized that developing an effective propeller and an efficient transmission linkage to the power plant were just as crucial as building a suitable engine. The Wrights understood that relatively little engine power was needed with efficient lifting surfaces and propellers. Such propellers were not available, however. Using their wind tunnel data, the Wrights designed the first efficient airplane propeller, treating the propeller as if it were a rotary wing. Design and construction of the propeller was the Wrights most original and purely scientific achievement. Perhaps the most influential individuals in history, Wilbur and Orville Wright, along with their mechanic Charles E. Taylor, combined their creative and technological genius to revolutionize transportation on planet Earth. These men helped create an entirely new world. The impact of the airplane would be beyond measure. The Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award are the most prestigious awards the FAA issues to pilots and mechanics to recognize individuals who have exhibited professionalism, skill, and aviation expertise for at least 50 years in the aircraft maintenance profession as master mechanics and or while piloting aircraft as master pilots. The recipient will receive the official FAA Blue Ribbon Package that is a complete history of the airman's mechanic and or pilot achievement documented by the FAA in Oklahoma City. It is a certified true copy of every document on file with the FAA. The recipient will also receive distinctive lapel pins for the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and for the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award. Upon request, Similar pins are also provided to the award recipient's spouse in recognition of his or her support to the recipient's aviation maintenance and piloting career. Once the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award have been issued, the recipient's name, city and state of residence, plus a month and year of the award presentation will be posted to the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award Electronic Roll of Honor and the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award Electronic Roll of Honor located on the web at www.fasafety.gov. The recipient will receive one or, depending upon their qualification, possibly even both distinctive certificates signed by the FAA Administrator one for the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award, and one for the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award. For more information on these awards, please talk with your local FAA safety team manager or visit us on the web at fasafety.gov. Now it is with great pleasure we introduce to you and take a brief look at the life of our newest Charles Taylor Master Mechanic and Wright Brothers Master Pilot Awards recipient.
Today, our distinguished airman and the recipient of the FAA's Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award is Captain Clarence Clyde Romero, Jr. Go ahead and stand up. Go ahead and stand up. Okay, I'm going to tell, tell you a couple of uh, tidbits about uh, Clyde, and I hope that's all right I call you Clyde. It's, it's in the records. <laughs> uh, so a couple of personal milestones that he's already mentioned. He's, he spoiled my, my presentation, but that's okay. He can do anything he wants. It's his day. Of course, 1969, I went to the United States Army. Uh, 69 also was his first solo at Fort uh, Walters uh, in Texas. In 1970, he graduated from Army Flight School. And also in 1970, he arrived in Vietnam. After Vietnam, he, he went to college and uh, joined the U.S. Air Force Flight School. And from there, he left active duty and joined the Air National, jo uh, Air National Guard. In 92, he retired from military service after the Gulf War. In 78 to 2015, he flew for American Airlines and retired after 37 years. 33 of those years as captain. His airman certificates and ratings. He is an AMP mechanic, a certificated AMP mechanic. He's a flight en engineer also an air transport pilot with airplane single engine and multi-engine land and a rotorcraft helicopter with instrument ratings. Aircraft ratings on his certificate were the Airbus uh, A320, A330, the Boeing 737, the Bell Helicopter 204 and 205. Some of his air, airman experience, and probably there's some in here that he's hidden and hasn't uh, let me know, so this is, may not be all inclusive. Uh, of course, he soloed in the, the U.S. Army in an OH-13 Sioux. Other aircraft flown includes in the U.S. Army the OH-6 Cayus, the OH-58 Kiowa, and the UH-1 Huey. In the U.S. National Guard, he flew the, the T-37 Tweet and the T-38 Talon. In the civilian world, we're talking airlines, again, the Airbus uh, A320 and the Boeing 737, and then the Bell helicopters uh, 204 and 205. A special side note about uh, uh, Clarence. A true article was written by James R. Childs about four young men serving in Vietnam. Their lives before, during, and after that conflict, and I'll call it a war. A lot of people were killed in it. The infamous Condors Quartet included four pilots, Clyde Romero, James Casher, Eldridge Johnson, Jr., and Bob Ferris. The picture's not a good picture, but uh, it's as good as I could get out of the newspaper and get a copy of it. Um, but they were assigned to a unit of the 101st Airborne Division Charlie Troop, 2nd Squadron of the 17th Cavalry, known as the Condors. And these four were seasoned helicopter pilots hence the Condor Quartet. They provided aerial support in 1971 for Operation Lamson 719. They were fighting foreign and domestic battles because of their color. The Condor's Quartet Vietnam Operation Lam Son nine, or 719 changed them. Then they waited for the world to get, catch up to them. For the rest of, story, of the story, you can talk to Captain Romero. 
he can fill you in on everything. But it's an outstanding story. And I know this isn't uh, the, probably not the platform to, to discuss this, but everybody should have this on their mind. We are a one people, period. And I don't understand why we can't figure that out. So the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award goes to Clarence J. Romero, Jr. Come on up here, Clarence. The rest of you who are helicopter pilots, Clyde has requested that uh, we come up and stand with him in support. And that's a pretty significant thing. A pilot to do that on a helicopter is pretty important day today. And uh, he gave a, a very stirring speech that the troops were uh, pretty excited to have him come and visit. He passed out some medals and that sort of thing. Uh, and one of the things that he said is that the, the Russians are hurting, being hurt more than Ukraine is hurting. Uh, now you can see here we're in the dark again uh, after more missile attacks uh, the other day and the day before. Uh, here on the power grid, it was uh, more the coldest day.